Now, uh, Elias, as, as we think about prognostication, there's, there's some new areas that have been raised as it's possible new markers. In fact, I'm sure in, uh, in, the, in, in large meetings such as ASH, we'll have a variety of, let's say, candidate type uh, new prognostic ways that, that get vetted over time. One of these was presented at ASCO, where they were actually looking at the leukemia stem cell phenotype as potentially being uh, another factor. They were looked at, th at three different components of the, of the stem cell, uh, the, the positive or negativity of the CD4, CD34 in terms of the blast, uh, a second population that was CD34 positive, CD38 negative, and then ALDH intermediate. This was the most common subtype in that group. Uh, and then another group that was CD34 positive, CD38 negative, and ALDH high. Uh, and they identified that that group that had that ALDH high, uh, CD34 positive, CD38 negative, really had a, a worse outcome. Uh, they had more association with complex cytogenetics uh, and certainly thought that it might have some implications in terms of therapy. How do you view uh, looking at the stem cell as a possible uh, additional way to risk stratify patients? Well, definitely it's a continuum of the spectrum. So we're identifying a group of patients who are doing poorly from the beginning. So you have at the early stage a population destined to do poorly, like in this abstract report, where they have what we call the high expression of aldehyde dehydrogenase. Mm -hmm. These are, they call it with bad features, which are all good. The question we have today, how do we treat these patients? What is the implication of identifying a poor players. Uh, Raphael mentioned a beautiful paper, and Rabbi quoted the P53 mutation in MDS. We say, well, if you have somebody with a bad feature, go for transplant, they still do poorly. So sure. these are all great to stratify our patients, but they have not yet changed our practice. I think what we need to do today, at least for the colleagues in the community, if you identify such a patient, refer them to clinical trials in order to improve the outcome. We are refining, we're retuning all our knowledge, uh, thanks to the biology and to the work done by colleagues like Raphael and others, but we're still we're not doing so well in treatment. I, I, I have to uh, agree so strongly. You know, as I, as I view our colleagues in pediatrics, you know, our pediatric colleagues have really been very successful in, in creating a, a, a culture where the standard of care is the clinical trial, you know, and that the percentage of pediatric patients that go on clinical trials is the vast majority, you know, and that there's this, you know, clearly this haggling, this, this discussion as to what that trial should be, but that there clearly is a need to push that forward, and they really have made some strides. In acute leukemia, I think we still struggle that, uh, that we still have patients really not being treated as part of uh, a, a clinical trial. There's so much for us we, we have to, to learn about the disease. Right. Uh, I think looking at the stem cell compartment could be interesting in two ways. Obviously, from a therapeutic point, that would be an ideal way if we can differentiate leukemia stem cells from normal stem cells, if we can identify certain receptors or targets in the leukemic stem cells where we can eradicate those, saving the normal stem cells. Uh, obviously, we have things now that are very uh, exciting, like with the CAR-T therapy, if you can identify the stem cells in leukemia and develop therapy for that. So it has a huge you know, therapeutic implication if we can identify the stem cells in, in those diseases. The other thing could be also in terms of monitoring of the disease, because many times the, the mutations or the uh, cytogenetic abnormalities are harbored in those stem cells. Uh, with our simple way of looking at cytogenetics now, we really don't look at the stem cells. We are looking at the probably common myeloid progenitor compartment, and in papers in MDS, for example, you show eradication of normal cyt complete cytogenetic response that sometimes does not correlate with outcome, but if you do sorting technique and you look at the stem cells, you look that the stem cells still harbor the mutation. So it could have a therapeutic implication and a monitoring implication paying attention to the stem, stem cell compartment. So before we uh, transition over to treatment, and this has been a great discussion around biology, Raf, your, your group has certainly been, been involved at various points in your career, really helping to distinguish that, that issue of progression. As you think about molecular features in a de novo AML patient and someone who potentially has progressed from, from MDS, uh, how might those two be different? Well, there was a really interesting paper last year uh, by Coleman Lindsley that examined this question. He took patients who had clear evidence of MDS or another myeloid disorder who progressed to secondary AML sequence them to figure out what types of mutations these patients have. 
And interestingly, there were many of the same mutations that you find in myelodysplastic syndromes and myeloproliferative neoplasms, things like splicing factor mutations, ASX01, and so on. Then he took another population of younger AML patients and found that their mutational profile was slightly different. They had more NPM1 mutations and more things like that. The important piece is that when we have older patients with AML, even if they didn't have a pre-existing diagnosis of a myelodysplastic syndrome, many of them have that MDS-like mutational pattern or phenotype, and those are the patients who don't do as well. And it may be one of the reasons that older AML patients have inferior outcomes. But the point is that there are older patients that don't have those features, and they may actually be at better risk than we suspect. So that identifying that population and actually thinking about the possibility of curing them with standard treatment if they can tolerate it has really identified a group of patients that may actually benefit from the types of treatments that we typically feel are probably less efficacious in the elderly. You know, Phil, I have a question. Uh, you know, in practice, uh, today we see the referral patterns, and sometimes we see physicians ordering a bunch of molecular features. Yeah. And there, I'm not to mention names, but there's plenty of uh, pharma groups or whatever they promote, and they will have tests, or people don't do nothing. A patient will come to you even just with the blood, with the CBC. Practically speaking, uh, the classification of literally ITD and PM1 mutation, CBP alpha, and others, are more of a concern for diploid karyotype. If I have somebody, in other terms, with a very bad karyotype, right. what is the weight of the other mutations? Do we need to do them, especially if I don't have a treatment to implement? That's a good point. So what is the clinical utility of knowing about these mutations? They, even in those patients who have bad risk features, these mutations can still have prognostic significance. I'll give you an example. Patients who have a complex karyotype don't all have mutations of TP53. Those patients that have that mutation, they really have the worst outcomes. But complex karyotype patients who lack that P53 mutation may do much better than you would have predicted based on that karyotype alone. So you may be able to even downstage their, their prognostic risk to some extent. Right. So I, I, th I think you could also good look at the good risk group in AML, for example, the inversion 16 or the translocation 821. If those patients have a secret mutation, that actually brings them to an intermediate risk group. So you could look at the two extremes of the... Uh, the mutations can refine prognosis right, refine, exactly. that's built in our existing system. So